Welcome back from lunch and welcome to those just joining us for the afternoon session. I'm Margaret Smith, President of Southern Tier Lime Support Inc. We have an exciting afternoon planned with our two physicians. Once again, if you have questions for the doctors, please write it on the index cards and deposit them into the speaker's box. Or you can tweet your question to at STLS Group. And for our first speaker this afternoon, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kenneth Bach. Dr. Kenneth Bach received his MD with honor from the University of Rochester School of Medicine in 1979 and is the founder of Bach Integrative Medicine in Red Hook, New York. He has been a pioneer and leader in the field of integrative medicine and has been treating Lyme disease and related infections for over three decades. Dr. Bach is a popular national and international speaker at major medical conferences and has appeared on numerous radio and television shows. He is on the faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine and is the co-author of The Road to Immunity and Natural Relief for Your Child's Asthma. His latest book, Healing the New Childhood Epidemics, Autism, ADHD, Asthma, and Allergies, has received international acclaim. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kenneth Bach. Also on the internet, so you got to let me know if I'm if I stray. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I haven't been to Binghamton since uh, when I was looking at colleges a few years ago, and uh, Binghamton was high up on my list. Um, that's for sure, and it's actually really a pleasure. Talk louder. Yes. Yeah, okay. That's better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to hear how well Binghamton has done. It just amazed me to watch the evolution of the state schools over all these years, and really the, the level of education. And one of my, my son is graduating uh, Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. One of his best friends is, I think, gonna be here today. And uh, it's really, it's an honor to see how, how really, over the last 30 years, how the, the level of education and the esteem that Binghamton has, has really grown. And I'm, Really a pleasure to be here. So that's how it's done. Um, it's also uh, a pleasure to talk to you about a couple of things. Actually, three things that I'm going to try to get, try to tie together for you. I know it's a Lyme conference, but I was asked to speak about not only Lyme disease and co-infections, but also an entity of what, what I call an infectious triggered brain inflammation called Pan's pandas, which we'll talk about. It may sound weird to you right now until we get into it and also autism spectrum disorders, which I've been treating also for many years. Lyme actually dates back, my first case of Lyme disease was 1985. And I remember it was a puzzling case of a swollen, red swollen toe, that was it. And I couldn't figure out what it looked like, an allergy, okay. And I couldn't figure out what it was, turned out that the guy who I had known had been to Block Island right before that, and lo and behold, I did my research and learned about Lyme disease and treated him and he got well with doxycycline and that led me into the whole field of Lyme disease. That was in 85. Uh, for autism spectrum disorders, it's more in the late 1990s that I really got into this um, speaking at a conference and then people bringing their kids to me and, and I've had a pretty good success in recovering numbers and numbers of autistic kids and, and then certainly I wrote about it about 10 years ago. So. And then lastly, this pans, pandas brain inflammation from infections like strep has really been the most recent thing, which is the largest growing part of my practice. And it just blows my mind what's happening to our kids. And so what I tried to do, this is the first time I've put all three of them together to try to show you the role of a dysregulated immune system in these three disorders. Okay, so let's see if this is gonna work. Do I have to Okay, hold on. Oh, there we go. This is just basically just in terms of the slide property, etc. You can do that. That uh, need to uh, ask permission to use these slides. 
Um, you, I gotta hold it up. All right. This is where I'm in Red Hook, New York. I happen to live in Woodstock, New York, or outside of Woodstock. This is my office in Red Hook, New York. And just a very quick aside, I see people uh, from all over the, the country and actually all over the world on a regular basis. It's pretty crazy. And I remember a Russian uh, uh, couple bringing their child and this Russian fellow sitting on my couch in my office and says to me, hey doc, can I ask you something personal? And so I'm a little worried what he's gonna ask me, but I say, okay. And he says, why are you not in New York City? Why are you here? And I said, because I'm lucky, I can. <laughs> and I imagine that maybe some of you might say the same about being here, living in a really nice community, having the things that you might love at your disposal, whether it be hiking, I'm a tennis player and a golfer. So, you know, one has to balance their life with their work. Anyway. Okay. So why don't we start this off with the connection between the nervous system and the immune system. We're going to call it the neuroimmune connection. And what this slide so nicely shows is this bi-directional, both ways, relationship between the immune system and the nervous systems, okay? One, one regulates the other, one drives the other, etc. This is a very intimate relationship, as you'll see on the next slide. Here you see a blood vessel, which you're gonna, I'm gonna describe over the next slide, which actually helps to separate the brain from other parts of the body, because the brain is privileged, as you'll see. And here we see neurons, this is a nerve cell, and companion cells called glia. Now this is a lot of, there's a bit of medical talk in here, I'm gonna to try to make it simple, and I wanna give you a caveat, okay? You're not gonna get tested, don't worry. I know you we're in a university, I know you're at desks where, you know, you're used to maybe, but you're not gonna get tested. In fact, I'm gonna teach you about the immune system, and some of these things are very, very complex. So I'm gonna, try to make it easy for you. I, I teach doctors of this all the time, and I hopefully can do my best to have it be understood for you. It's very important that you understand this because if for you to understand what is going wrong, not only with kids, but with people in terms of Lyme disease and brain inflammation, you need to understand some of these interactions. So what we have here is neurons, nerve cells, and companion cells, they're called glia. Uh, in this diagram, these are called astrocytes, Look at the intimacy. I'm talking about intimacy here for those. This is wrapped around a synapse where message molecules are going, okay? And also connected to the blood, to this blood vessel, which you're gonna see makes up the blood-brain barrier. What's not pictured here, you'll see another slide, is another form of glia called microglia, which is the immune cell in the nervous system, okay? So we have a very intimate relationship between these glia, including immune cells, and the nerve cells. Yes, this blood-brain barrier is something that separates, keeps the brain separated. Why? Because your brain is extremely, extremely sensitive, especially to toxicants. So we have this blood-brain blood, blood barrier. It makes it a privileged organ and very protected. But we're gonna see that there are certain things that disrupt that blood-brain barrier and make it easier for things to reach the brain that shouldn't be there, unfortunately. So here's another schematic, and I like schematics. You don't need to know all the details, but I want you to understand the framework of what I'm talking about. So here we have that blood-brain barrier, the blood vessel, right? Here we have that neuron, and look at all these big words. You don't need to know them, but these are all what we call antigens, little, these are proteins on the nerve cell, all right? Here are the astrocytes I was telling you about that have intimate relationships with the synapses as well as the blood-brain barrier. And here is that other cell that wasn't pictured called microglia, the immune cells of the nervous system, okay? So they all have these proteins that are part of who they are, okay? And help them do what they do. And you'll see where that's important in a second. Okay, so we have that relationship between nervous system and the immune system. Now we're gonna to move to the next very important relationship, that between the gut and the brain. So some of you might be sitting there going, what the heck is this guy talking about, the gut brain? But don't sometimes people even say, boy, that's a gut reaction? Because there's a huge nervous system in the gut, first of all. And there was a book, a really great book written a number of years ago uh, called the, the Second Nervous System, and it's about the gut nervous system. 
So there are some things in medicine that we know that you can do something in the gut and actually affect the function of the brain. And classically, anybody here, doctors? I know there's a few, but not many doctors here. A couple, right? Yeah, I got you. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll probably be talking a little bit, uh, you know, at a level that I, I that, uh, so that more people can understand it. But in medical school, we learned about a classic condition called hepatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy means pathology of the brain. And you could be stuporous, lethargic, stuporous, even comatose, based on a, uh, a liver failure and liver gut, right? And lo and behold, you could treat the gut. You use something called lactulose. It helps move uh, the bowels and moves the toxins out of the gut. And you could affect the functioning of the brain. You could take somebody from being comatose or stuporous to actually more alert. In integrative medicine, we have something called candida, a fungal dysbiosis, a yeast infection in the gut, that you give them an antifungal, like my statin or fluconazole, or a natural antimicrobial, and you control the yeast and give them a very good, high, uh, very strong potency probiotic, and you knock down the yeast in the gut, and lo and behold, what do you get rid of? You can get rid of their brain fog and their cognitive dysfunction. You haven't given them anything that directly affects the brain cells. You've just done it by the gut. So this gut-brain axis is very important, and actually it's been an essential part of integrative medicine for decades, but it is really making its way into conventional medicine now by, have anybody heard of the microbiome Yes, I see some hands are microbiota. I have a slide to talk about that in a second. But what's happening in your gut and the microbes are so, so important to your health. This is a huge line of research. We are, we are really on this exponential growth curve. And you, if you haven't heard about it, you'll hear about it today, and you will hear more about it in the days to come, no question. So just very briefly, this is your, the epithelial lining of your gut. And you notice here you have these tight junctions. This is what keeps out a lot of the stuff that you shovel into your gut. And we have something that actually makes me very sad called the Standard American Diet, SAD, that is really more than sad, it should frighten you. And what we shovel into our guts, in our mouth and our guts on a daily basis, is pretty scary. And so this epithelial barrier has to keep certain things out. So we need to have this, they're called tight junctions. And also, this is a schematic of all the immune cells that lie under that epithelial or uh, lining. And 70 to 75% of your immune system, that part of your body, the immune system, that is, that is important in recognizing yourself versus something <coughs> non-self, like bacteria and viruses, and Mounting an attack against something like a virus or a bacteria or even a cancer cell, something that's foreign, but not reacting to self. It's a very, very amazingly smart system. But you think it's a coincidence that 70, 75% of it is in our gut? No, because that is where so many decisions have to be made. The immune system has to decide, hey, this particle, is it just a, a benign food particle? Or is it a bacteria? Or is it a good bacteria? Or a bad bacteria? Et cetera, et cetera. So I just put this in here again to have you realize that the immune system and the gut are intimately relation, related. These are very, very uh, intimate relationships and very important ones. And this is just an article that talks about the host microbiota. That just means microbiota means all the microorganisms in your gut. Okay, so I know these are medical articles and you don't have to you know, read them all, but the point is that the bacteria and other microorganisms in your gut vitally regulate those microglia. What are the microglia? I showed you, those are the immune cells in the nervous system that are very, very important to the proper functioning of your brain cells. And look at this, they are related to the bacteria and this is just another schematic, and 
some of these slides, slides are used uh, courtesy of my friend and colleague, Dr. Vajani. Um, and basically, here you see a schematic that these bacteria with things like really good complex carbohydrates like psyllium, hemp seed, flax seed, as well as the production of these short chain fatty acids influence the brain via their influence on these microglia, the immune cells in the gut, okay? So now we've gone from this neuroimmune relationship to this triad, this gut-brain immune relationship. And what do we notice again? This is bi-directional. In other words, each system influences the other. These are not one-way streets. These are all two-way streets, okay? So I call that gastroneuroimmunology, but the bottom line is it's the interrelationships between the brain, the gut, and the immune system, okay? All right, another schematic just to let you know that there are numbers of influences, number of environmental factors that can influence these tight junctions and then allow the gut to get more permeable and let things in that shouldn't. And you'll see why uh, in the next slide. But things like drugs and chemicals, things like dietary peptides, things like gluten, that's in wheat, barley, and rye, and casein, that's a protein in dairy, among others, either soy or what have you, um, and infections, and stress, yes, stress. Stress can damage the, the gut and make it more permeable. And what it does, it induces what we call this immune dysregulation in the gut. Remember I showed you all those immune cells, 70 to 75% of them in the gut. They can induce these uh, immune cells to be dysregulated. They, they don't function the way they're supposed to. And what they do is they produce these very inflammatory messenger molecules, again, you're not gonna be tested on these tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-6, and then ultimately IL-1 beta, but these are inflammatory immune messenger molecules. It's the way the immune system cells speak with each other, as well as the way they speak to nerve cells and hormone cells, etc. It's the language of the immune system. But the problem is this uncouples this tight junction, and then you get things getting through the gut that shouldn't get there. And what happens is that induces not only inflammation in the gut, but it induces systemic inflammation, okay? And here you see what happens. These inflammatory molecules now get up to what I showed you, that blood-brain barrier that's so important in separating the brain <coughs> from the periphery so that, because the brain is so sensitive to these. But what happens? inflammatory molecules, inflammatory limb cells, which I'm gonna show you in a second, get through this now permeable blood-brain barrier, which it wasn't supposed to be, and they wreak havoc in the nervous system, causing inflammation. And now you see all these letters that, remember I showed you, were so nicely embedded in the neuron? Now they're released, and now the immune system is recognizing them as something foreign, and we're getting more and more inflammation. And in this case, if the inflammation is in the brain, we call it brain inflammation or neuroinflammation, okay? And some things that can affect this permeability of the brain are heavy metals, like lead and mercury, which we have to be aware of. PCBs can disrupt the blood-brain barrier integrity, chemicals, and air pollution, yes long-term exposure to air pollution, especially in pregnancy, which is the most scary in the third term of pregnancy, but air pollution can disrupt the blood-brain barrier, causing neuroinflammation. So when we start asking, Why the heck, what's going on with our populations? I don't know about you, but I am seeing more and more people with cancer at younger ages, and we were supposed to be the advanced generation, more than our parents. And yet I am, I've lost, in, in the last two, three years, I've lost five friends uh, to a combination of things, uh, at least one or two, uh, cancer and heart. And you say, why are people dying, you know, in their 50s or young 60s when we should be living really longer because 
especially if you eat a decent diet and we, we know all these things supposedly, well, I think it's because a lot of these toxicants, and when we ask what the heck is happening to our kids, a lot of it is because of these toxicants in susceptible people. Okay. So here again, you see the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. It may have been anything that I just showed you. It could have been uh, chemicals, it could have been heavy metals, it could have been air pollution, it could be other things that affect the gut, bringing in these uh, things that cause inflammation. And you see here these immune cells squeezing through places they shouldn't have gotten through. And you see how nice and organized this is. Here you see the, these antigens that are on the nerve but look again, here you see an inflamed neuron releasing all these antigens, and we see more and more inflammation. I spent a lot of time at the beginning on this because I want you to understand what we're talking about when I'm talking about brain inflammation. It is very pertinent to the later stages of this talk, which will be very clinical. But, so I thought I'd start with autism spectrum disorders, and then I would do the PANS PANDAS, and then I'll end with mine, and I'll do the treatment, okay? So in terms of the autism spectrum disorders. Firstly, this is a staggering statistic. And, um, sorry if I keep on moving out a little bit, but just the nature of how I like to speak. Um, I'm a New York boy who likes to speak with his hands and move a little bit, so. Um, this is the annual survey for the National Health Statistics Report in November of 2015. So they come out with statistics. This is from the CDC. So the C CDC comes out with stats. So this is not controversial. This is CDC, Centers for Disease Control, right? So I've been following this because I wrote about it in my book in 2007. And uh, I've been doing this probably since 1998, 99. So it's about 20 years. And way back when I started 30 years ago, the statistics of, or, of autism may have been 1 in 10,000 conservatively one in 5,000, or really conservatively one in 2,500, but probably one in 5,000, right? And if you look at the years, the statistics, the incidence of autism has increased. So it went from one in 2,500 to one in 500, to one in 250. And this is every few years. One in, six, one in 168, one in 150, one in 110, one in 91, one in 88, one in 68. And the last figure in November of 2015 was 1 in 45. Now, I don't know if that blows your mind, but it blows my mind. And we don't need any mind-altering substances to have your mind blown with that statistic. 1 in 45 children now have autism. That's approximately 2.2% of children. If this keeps going this way, what are we going to do? Not only the cost of maintaining these kids and treating them, what about society? What do we do if it keeps on increasing? So this begs the question, and I can show you the same with ADHD, because when I first started lecturing uh, years ago, ADHD was one in 16, uh, then it, it was one in 11, now, uh, then one in 10, and it just kept on decreasing. And this is not genetics. Genetics does not make epidemic. These kind of statistics I just showed you for autism is an epidemic. So I always ask the question, what the heck is happening to our children? And I don't know if anybody in the audience, I'm not going to ask, but if I, if I come to an autism conference and I'm speaking to, let's say, a thousand people, if I ask them to put up their hands, most of the people there have kids with autism. I ask about ADHD, a lot of hands go up. There's a lot of overlap. Then I ask about asthma, some hands go up, not as many. And I ask for allergies and a lot, another, again, a lot of hands go up. So there's a lot of kids walking around with one, two, three, or even four of the four A's, what I call autism, ADHD, asthma, and allergies. But this is about autism and inflammation, but I just want you to realize the statistics. That you can take home, one in 45 kids. And we're gonna have another one this November, it's probably gonna be, I don't know, we'll see. So why again? So this is a hypothesis, this is not proven, but myself and many of my colleagues certainly feel this is true that autism spectrum disorders arise from a combination of genetic predisposition, vulnerability, susceptibility, as you will, combined with environmental insults and triggers, because there's no way you get a genetic epidemic. You need the environment involved. 
The primary underlying genetic vulnerability appears to be in many children, an impaired ability to detoxify, and environmental insults include toxins, such as heavy metals, pesticides, and other chemicals, agricultural chemicals, industrial chemicals, as well as food sensitivities, allergies, and infections. That is the hypothesis that unifies the four A's, but in this situation, we're talking about autism spectrum disorder. Autism is classically defined by its behaviors, uh, impaired social communication, uh, impaired uh, social interaction, markedly restricted interests, re repetitive behaviors. If ever you've been in an airport, you've seen a kid stimming or that kind of look. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to diagnose a frank autistic kid. And although the diagnostic categories have expanded a little bit, which may account for a, a certain amount of this increased incidence, there is no way in heck it accounts for it all. And yet I've had arguments with people who I think are smart, who will try to say it's all diagnostic uh, classifications by opening it. But it's defined behaviorally. You, you look at it, a child, you watch them, and you define them by, uh, by their behaviors. But it's not behavioral. It, it is defined, it is a biological disorder. It's, it's defined by behavioral characteristics. So in many ways, it's a systemic inflammatory disorder that also involves the brain. So inflammation of the brain, it turns out there's also inflammation in the immune system, there's inflammation uh, in the gut, but here we're talking about neuroinflammation. The dysfunction involves the nervous system, including neurotoxicity, the gut, the metabolic system, and the immune system. And in the immune system, there is dysregulation. Numbers of them have the deficiency or de dysfunction of the immune system. Others have a overreactive immune system, hypersensitivity or allergy to things like foods or dust or molds. And then you take that kind of allergy to yourself and it's called autoimmunity, where the immune system is not differentiating self from non-self and is reacting to self. You're not supposed to react to yourself. On a gross level, you need to be tolerant of yourself. We all make mistakes. If we were getting down on ourselves and reacting to ourselves all the time, we would be in big trouble. We need to learn how to not react to self. Well, in the case of the autistic kids, a subset of them have autoimmunity, and many of them have inflammation. And this was from a very esteemed scientific publication, the New York Times, in August 2012, where uh, Moses Velasquez Manoff was talking about immune disorder and immune dysregulation, a dysregulated immune system uh, with inflammation and all these pro-inflammatory messenger molecules being at the root of autism in a subset of at least a third, it's probably more than that, and saying, and this was read by millions and millions of people, thankfully, that this just goes to show that this, quote, behavioral disorder is really got biological roots, and therefore maybe we can find some actual treatments based on the causes rather than just treating behaviors. Okay. And this is the last slide on autism. This article came out in the Annals of Neurology in 2005 by Var Vargas and colleagues at John Hopkins University about neuroglial activation. Remember those microglia, the immune system cells activated in the brain and neuroinflammation in the brain of patients with autism. This actually, and what they did is they took, it was 11 kids with autism who died of accident or injury. They uh, biopsied their brain and lo and behold, these are all inflammatory cells. These are inflammatory cells around the small blood vessels. These are inflammation. And I go to a think tank every year with 40 or 50 experts from around the country and around the world in the field, uh, in various fields, who are trying to really solve the puzzle of autism. I've been honored to be a part of it. Brilliant minds. I'm talking brilliant minds. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't make it this year. I, lectured, I was lecturing in Toronto last week, and I had already committed. So I, I had to miss it, and I hate missing it. But um, this article, when it came out, changed the direction, because we said, wow, we've got to be dealing with inflammation documented neuroinflammation in these kids, and it really helped us get a lot of kids better. So that's how you translate the scientific research to the clinic with the researchers and the clinicians meeting together. Okay, so let me give you a few minutes on Immunology 101, because you need to learn this, because as I go through the 
pans, pandas, and even the line when we talk about inflammation. I want you to know about the players, okay? Again, take a deep breath. There's no tests here, but I think it's important. And for some of you, I'm, I'm gonna try to make it really, really simple. Okay, so we have the immune system. You have barriers. I showed you the barrier in the gut. Your skin is a barrier to prevent things from getting in. The microbes in the gut are a barrier, okay? Then you have these nonspecific uh, immune cells, like these called phagocytes, natural killers of macrophages. These are cells that go about and try to kill things that shouldn't be there nonspecifically. Then you go to the next level of kind of intelligence in some way, and you have the specific immune cells that are programmed to react to a specific antigen, like a cold virus, or a monovirus, or a strep bacteria. So those, in that part of the system, the learned or specific immune system, we're talking about antibodies, which are immune proteins, and lymphocytes, T and B cells, okay? So the cells in the immune system are these B cells. These are the cells that produce antibodies, immunoglobulins, immune proteins that help fight. You get a cold, your immune system revs up, and you produce antibodies to the cold virus. It takes a little while to get over it, and then you're hopefully back to normal, okay? These are the cellular part of the immunity. So that's the part of the antibody immune immunity. These are the T cells. And there are various kinds of T cells. T helper cells that upregulate an immune system. Like when you get that cold virus, a helper T cell comes around, recognizes and says, yo boys or girls, come over here, we need to fight, right? And they cause the B cells to produce the right antibodies. They get some cells activated and they fight the infection. There are also, though, these Treg cells that towards the end come back and say, okay, guys and girls, we're ready to go back to normal. We've, we've won the fight. Let's regulate, okay? So that's a very important cell because people with chronic fatigue syndrome, sometimes they have a revved up immune system that doesn't shut off. So they're not immune deficient. Their immune system, these are people with chronic fatigue, with sleep problems, with pain, with swollen lymph glands, with sometimes sore throats, their immune system has gotten turned on and doesn't turn off. And you need to turn it off. And these Tregs are, are very important cells in regulating the immune system. So here we see it very easily schematic. There are different kinds of T, T helper cells. T helper one, involved with the cell mediated immunity. T helper two, involved with allergies and the antibody mediated immunity, the immune proteins and then these Tregs that balance them both out, okay? I only put this slide in, it's very complex, just to show you that there are pro-inflammatory immune messenger molecules, cytokines are immune messenger molecules, and anti-inflammatory. So if you take anything from these away, that there are both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory messenger molecules with this tumor necrosis factor alpha, being inflammatory and IL-10 being anti-inflammatory. The reason I say this is you'll see later on that there are things, nutrients and things that can affect these, okay? And here's a beautiful schematic, again, with permission from uh, Dr. Bajani, showing these Tregs being the harmonic conductor of balance between the Th1 and Th2 uh, parts of the immune system. If you have too much Th2, you're predisposed to allergies. And a lot of our kids have too much TH2. Heavy metals, lead, mercury, skew to TH2. Chemicals can skew to TH2 and decrease uh, Tregs. So, which helps to explain, wow, what's going on? It's a lot of the environment that's involved here. So, I'm gonna finish up with these. This is ten, only 10 years ago. The immune system is always evolving. For those of you who went to medical school, remember how every year there was a different textbook for the immu immunology. Well, I'm not, it's still evolving. And this is a cell that was described only around 10 years ago called TH17 that was recognized to be, aha, this is the T helper cell that's involved with inflammation and autoimmunity. Okay. Including autoimmunity the nervous system. Okay. So, another schematic for you to see. Again, 
this, this is one that you can maybe just a picture, but let it, let it kind of sit in your brain a little bit. We have a T cell that can go in all these different directions depending on the messages it gets. I don't really care if you know the messages, that's not that important. The point is that it can go to this Th1, cell mediated immunity, Th2, more like allergies, Th3 or Tregs, which are so important in regulating the immunity, and Th17, involved with inflammation and autoimmunity, okay? That is basically your immune system primer. And again, you don't have to remember it all, but I, to me, it is amazing that the nervous system and the immune system, the two most complex systems in the body, work as well as they do. Because if you notice all these different messenger molecules, if you look at the nervous system with all these different neurotransmitters, it is amazing that these things work as well as they do. And again, heavy metals can affect the immune system, all parts, just like it can the blood-brain barrier. The same thing with chemicals. Here's BPA in plastics can actually cause a decrease in your Tregs. The Tregs, those regulatory T cells, are so important in maintaining immune balance. And plastics, plasticizers, BPA, you know where it's in? Credit card receipts. Mm -hmm. And there's a recommendation in this article that pregnant women avoid credit card receipts because BPA is such a potent toxicant. And I'll give you another piece of advice. When you microwave, do not microwave in plastic. If you take anything home, that's a big take home. It doesn't have anything to do with Lyme disease, except that it will, it will affect your immune system. You microwave in glass, okay? Because the microwave heat leaches out the plasticizers into the food, and you don't want these plasticizers, okay? Ultimately, if there's this immune balance, we get autoimmunity, where we get an activation of these B and T cells that react to self, we get the production of antibodies or immune proteins to self, and ultimately inflammation. Remember, the sine qua non, the most important premise of your immune system, is to differentiate self from non-self. To react to non-self, viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, but to not react to self. When you lose that distinction, when your immune system loses that ability, to distinguish self from non-self, you get autoimmunity. And what's happening here in autoimmunity? There's been an increase in autoimmunity over the last 30 years, just like the four A's, right? And so when I lecture sometimes on the four A's, I've had people come up to me and ask me, well, why didn't you make it the five A's with Alzheimer's? Truthfully, the book was like 430 pages already. I didn't really want to make something that's gonna give people uh, hernias. So, but basically, um, and also autoimmune diseases, the same thing. And you'll notice, what is it? There are environmental factors that are contributing. Things like Western dietary habits, the environmental surroundings, and pollution exposure. Various kinds of infections and stress load. All of these together are neurotoxicants, immunotoxicants, and they've led to a rise, a parallel rise in the autoimmune diseases as part of what we call the environmental mosaic of autoimmunity. And just remember in that uh, mosaic of autoimmunity, one of the key elements is infections. And that brings us back to why we're here. We're talking about Lyme disease. We're talking about infections. For those of you, I hope you will see by the end of this lecture why I'm spending time on this. Because I want you to have the proper underpinnings. If I just come in here and give you all these things, and you, you're not gonna understand. And I know there's a lot of details here. You don't have to know them all. You, if you take anything away, it's a whole thing about immune balance, okay? All right, so let's go to PANS, PANDAS. This is PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. I want you to say that really fast. No, no, no. Um, this is a mnemonic. Uh, first came out uh, in 1998, an article by Sue Sweeto at the NIMH and her colleagues. Um, I don't love this because it's just strep, and it limits it to strep, but it is very important for your understanding. Um, and it's been expanded since, and I'll share that with you. But this is a whole uh, element, and I'll show you, where after you get a strep infection, everybody knows, you know, your kids, adults get a strep throat, right? And you treat it with antibiotics and you're okay, right? 
Well, if you don't treat the strep throat, it, the symptoms will go away. So if you have a sore throat, a swollen gland or something, and you think it's a virus, you don't get treatment, you will eventually get better. The, strip, the antibiotic helps you get better a bit quicker. The problem is there's a very small percentage, but it's a very significant percentage. I believe in rheumatic fever, it was 3%, but don't quote me, but I think that's what it was. We don't really see it much anymore. But if you don't treat the strep, because of a genetic subtype, you, you get it an, an autoimmune reaction. In the case of rheumatic fever, to your heart, because there's a certain, we call epitope, certain very tiny part of a protein in the heart that looks like that's a part of the strep bacteria, and the antibody that's made to fight the strep mistakes that part of the heart, the heart of strep, and you get autoimmunity. The same thing happens with big word in medicine. The first year of medicine, by the way, it's like you're learning Spanish or French. You're learning medicalese. It's all language. The male nephritis, big word for inflammation of the kidney, and there is a post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Sydenham chorea is a cousin of both of these, especially rheumatic fever, but rather than the antibody react to the, uh, to the heart, it's reacting to a small part of a, it's called an epitope, a tiny piece of a protein in the basal ganglia. It's a very tiny part of the lower part of the brain, not the outside, but inside of the brain that's responsible for a number of things, including movement disorders. And so when that gets attacked and you get inflammation, you had people doing what's called St. Peter's dance, just like crazy flailing and could be babbling. They could have all kinds of tics. Um, but it was known as St. Peter's dance with this wild flailing of the hands and legs, uncontrollable, right? And I've actually seen some cases now I had learned about it in the medical school, never saw a case, but I saw a, an unbelievable case of a 35-year-old woman lawyer who came up from Florida who was extremely sick, and now a year later she's a different person. It's very thankful that that happened. But she literally had Korea in my office where she'd be flailing and then babbling, almost babbling like an infant. This was an intelligent lawyer who had lost a lot of her cognitive function until we figured out that it wasn't only Lyme, but it was severe mold exposure and, uh, and a deep-seated osteomyelitis uh, in, the, in the nasal mode. It was a very complex case with autoimmunity. But the point being is these are all post-strep disorders. They're very well documented. There's no question about them. PANDAS is a, fo a form frust of Sydenham career. In other words, it's post-streptococcal. You get things I'm going to show you. Uh, it's not quite as dramatic as Sydenham's chorea. In this case, sometimes you'll get, not only do you get ticks like blinking, head ticks, you know, or if you put the hands out, you get this piano-like movement of the fingers. We call that chorea form movement. It's not flailing, although you can have more dramatic things. Um, but yet, oddly enough, it's, quote, controversial. As you heard uh, that woman who, who did that, and I really thank her for making this because her daughter really wanted to get this message out is that um, they don't believe in it. And if your medical school, if the powers to be at your medical school in the area don't believe in it, like a pediatric neurologist who doesn't believe it exists, and most of the pediatricians don't believe it exists, and literally people go to somebody with, a, to me, a clear-cut case of something that I might be able to help, and they're told it's just anxiety or OCD. And that's part of why we're giving these lectures to educate people. So here's the symptoms, tics, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, lining things up, opening, closing doors, hand washing. I have kids that can't leave their room for hours because they have to go through rituals before they come downstairs, if they come downstairs at all. The worst case I had was a 14-year-old girl from Connecticut, basically, who couldn't leave her room, who could not leave her room. And, and, and you can imagine what happens if you don't leave your room for such a long period of time. It is frightening, it breaks up families. I've had kids who could not be with their fathers and fathers had to move out. I mean, this is a severe thing. They stop eating, they lose tons of weight, they get anxious, they get such separation anxiety, they won't leave their mother, so they can't go to school. And I'm not talking about a four-year-old. This could be an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old. They have personality changes where they, they go to bed one night, their normal, loving, smart, athletic, gorgeous self, and still wake up gorgeous, but end up being a monster, like suicidal, homicidal, throwing things, rages. I, it, it gets that bad. 
So emotional ability, rage episodes, psychotic symptoms. They either hallucinate visually or hearing voices, and these voices can tell them to do some very, very bad things. They get oppositional, uh, like ADHD type things, and they can have bad nightmares. They also have neurological symptoms. We call dysgraphia, a decline in handwriting, and in their math skills. Really good math students can't even do simple addition or subtraction sometimes. It gets that bad. And here's examples of dysgraphia. Here is the, what happened during a flare of pandas, and here is after treatment with IVIG. Here's another one. Look how good it was before. This is during, and this is after. Maybe not quite as good, but still much improved. Again, another one. Look at the detail here, and look at the loss of that detail here. They lose the fine motor function in this illness because of the, the, the basal ganglia is affected. And lastly, this is one of my, that was from the literature, this is one of my patients uh, who writes a nice little thankful to, you, to their mother. This is when they were normal, and then this is during a flare. It says after it's during a flare. Look at that. Now, are you going to tell me that doesn't exist? I just don't get how some of my colleagues could say this condition doesn't exist. Other things you might see, I've told you those career form movements, cognitive deficits, appearance or worsening of ADHD symptoms, inattention, decreased focus, uh, motoric hyperactivity, impulsivity, and then a couple of other somatic or bodily complaints, bedwetting that they didn't have before, and urinary frequency, they're like peeing every 15 minutes or feeling like they have to, and you look at their urine, you look at the urine culture, they don't have infections. This is all related, these are clues. Less frequent, but also very significant, anorexia, stuttering, where kids start stuttering out of nowhere, spasmodic torticollis, which is like to be like a, a neck spasm, which can be pretty bad, and dysphonia. I have one patient that comes in and says, hello, Dr. Bob. How are you? That's dysphonia. Okay. So this, is, this was the initial working definition in 1998. Um, and I'm not going to belabor it because it's been updated, but presence of OCD or tics. Here is no longer accepted. Prepubertal or pediatric, usually between 2 and 12 years of age, onset of symptoms. We know it can happen later, so it's not limited to that. An episodic course of symptom severity and abrupt onset. Very usually, it's a quite abrupt onset. Symptom association with group A pneumatic strep and associated with neurological abnormalities like career flow movements or hyperactivity. Okay. So, but that was to strep, and it happens that it's, strep is not the only uh, infection that causes this kind of sy syndrome. So in 2012, a number of uh, experts were convened, and they came up with the criteria for something that was renamed, which I like better, although I prefer the name infectious triggered autoimmune encephalitis. This is pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome. You will not have to say that fast, don't worry. And you can say PANS. So there was PANDAS, which is strictly related to strep, and this is PANS that is basically saying something happens, you get an infection, but you get this acute neuropsychiatric syndrome, all right? And here we have the abrupt dramatic, on, abrupt dramatic onset of OCD. But here, rather than put tic, tic disorders first, which they're very prominent, usually severely restricted food intake. If you have a kid who eats normally and wakes up one morning and all of a sudden is refusing to eat food, and that continues for more than just a, a morning or a day because they got food poisoning or whatever, they got a GI bug. But uh, you have to start thinking, what is going on for that? person for that child or teenager, adolescent, even young adults. The other symptoms are very much similar to what we talked about. Uh, here uh, is put in uh, irritability uh, and you know the ability and all the other things I talked about. But here, behavioral regression. Sometimes a kid will actually regress to the point they're acting like a toddler and they're 12 to 14 years old. When that happens and, and they're told by the pediatrician, oh, they have school avoidance. They just don't want to go to school. It's like, come on, come on. This was a healthy, active kid. He had friends, and now he, can't, he doesn't want to be with friends or can't be with friends. So, and then, you know, sensory motor abnormalities. They, have a, they may have a sensitivities to sound or light or tactile sensitivities. And then, of course, the dysgraphia and the vocal tics that I told you about, the uh, bedwetting and the urinary frequency and also sleep disturbances in the kid who didn't have them before. 
And as always, in terms of the medicine, we always say symptoms are not better explained by a known neurological or medical disorder such as Sydenham Korea, lupus, Tourette's disorders, or others. But I would add, just so you know, if you know anybody with Tourette's, I've had a number of kids with Tourette's that I've been able to diagnose the syndrome and have them get better because Tourette's, they're treated, they're not treated for any kind of infection. And they're not given IVIG or immune modulators like nutritional. So they're all usually giving things like that behavior modification, the things to modify ticks. So um, I think we have to think about this sometimes in some of the kids with Tourette's. So here's the pathogenesis or what, what lies behind it. You get a strep infection. This is for pandas now. You get a strep infection and in a genetically susceptible host that you get a misdirected immune response. This is uh, from Sue Sweeto, I love this. I used to call it an aberrant immune response, but really is a misdirected immune response, not just to that bacteria, but to a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, that when it gets inflamed in an autoimmune type fashion, can cause all these symptoms I just told you about, and then I'll talk about treatment towards the end of this. So part of the uh, pathogenesis, as we say in medicine, or part of the, re uh, the causation is this molecular mimicry, and part is this TH17 Treg imbalance. So it's just another schematic, very quickly, this is what I told you about, where you have a healthy immune system, you're not reacting to self. But in this situation of PANS, you get a foreign organism, let's say it could be a strep, the immune system reacts to it, and look at here, there's a part of your own self, in this case it would be the basal ganglia, that looks enough like this strep that the antibodies or the T cells <laughs> react to this part of the basal ganglia in an autoimmune fashion causing inflammation. And secondly, the other thing is, this is newer, that was how it was believed for all these years, but this is the newer part where there's belief that there may be a link between group A, beta-hemolytic strep, the one that causes a strep sore throat, and that TH17 inflammatory T cell responses that could tip the balance towards autoimmunity. And here you see uh, just the graphic saying in these situations, the TH17 are too turned on, they're upregulated, and they outweigh the Treg in these post strep disorders. So really taken together, these findings are consistent with autoimmune-mediated inflammation of the basal ganglia, or what I put together and I called autoinflammation. That wasn't the name of this article. But. And I was just in Canada, it was perfect. This is a, from a Canadian journal, so I was in Toronto, so I gained a lot of favor by uh, producing a Canadian journal. Uh, and I told you there are naysayers. There are people who don't believe it. You heard that in the video. Well, this is from uh, researchers uh, Pichichiro and Murphy. Pichichiro is from my alma mater, University of Rochester School of Medicine. And this is in from a very reputable pediatric journal. And what does he conclude? We conclude that there is an association between sudden onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms, especially OCD, and group A beta hemolytic strep, tonsillopharyngitis, you know, inflammation of the, the throat and the tonsils in some previously healthy children. This is document, this is not the only article, there are many articles that document this, and the fact that some people would still say we don't believe it exists, I have to tell you in layman's terms, blows my mind. <laughs> this is a whole uh, issue uh, a couple of years ago on uh, PANS, and basically concluding that the link between inflammation and psychiatric disorder is slowly becoming strong, stronger, and understanding PANS may not only help us understand how to better diagnose and treat youth with this syndrome, but with others with developmental neuropsychiatric syndromes and potentially the pathogenesis of psychiatric disorders as a whole, okay? So this is the other side, though. This is from two authors who are very prominent pediatric neurologists who don't really believe that this exists, and they've been proponents that it doesn't exist. They quoted an epidemiological study um, to support it, and so this is the kind of thing that unfortunately keeps this quote controversial, and that's why I don't like to use the name pandas, because I rather avoid the controversy and call it what it is. It's an infectious triggered brain inflammation. Okay. There, are, there is evidence to support the pandas diagnosis. Um, uh, symptom exacerbation following uh, group A beta hemolytic strep infection 
positive throat culture. If you get that, that helps. Elevated strep antibodies, ASO, DNASB. Elevated antineuronal antibodies. And uh, family history of autoimmunity, OCD, tick disorders. And, and if there's a positive response to antibiotics and or immunomodulatory therapies, like plasmapheresis or IVIG, that would support, okay? So antineuronal antibodies, this is just a study from uh, last year. Uh, current evidence supports the hypothesis that antineuronal antibodies, antibodies against those proteins on uh, the neurons, specifically against dopamine receptors, follow strep exposures and may target dopamine receptors. And some of the movement disorders are related to altered dopamine transmission and alter central dopamine pathways leading to movement and neuropsychiatric disorders. Okay, and here's just this quote that the Cunningham panel, and this is just some elevation. I've seen some people with much more elevation, but the point is you can get elevation and you can document that there's autoimmunity, okay? And then there's an emerging link saying that new research will aim to determine whether a subset of what we currently diagnose as primary psychiatric disorders are in fact due to definable, treatable autoimmune syndromes. And remember, autoimmune syndromes, the mosaic of autoimmune environmental factors, immunologic, genetic, hormonal, but among these key elements, remember the impact of infections on the development of autoimmune. That is very substantial. And in addition to strep, we see the common cold virus. Sinus infections can trigger this syndrome. Mycoplasma pneumonia, other viruses, influenza, chickenpox virus, varicella zoster, herpes simplex that gives you cold sores, or vaginal herpes, or genital herpes, because it could be on men as well, um, and Lyme disease. And this is a, an article about the kind of the, the overlap of Lyme disease and pandas, and I would say other tick-borne infections, specifically Bartonella. Anybody knows co-infections here? How many people are uh, familiar with co-infections in this audience? Now I know who I'm talking to. I know I figured that was the case, of course. Well, we have something, if you haven't called Bartonella Rage. Some of these kids have Bartonella, they get Bartonella Rage, but some of it's not only the infection, some of it may also be the autoimmunity related to either Lyme or Bartonella. So um, this is a good segue to move into Lyme and Co-infections, I think I'm pretty much on time now, so um, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, and I know it's a lot of information, so um, I know I'm bombarding your brains. And I would tell you to stand up for a second, but usually that's going to end up taking five or ten minutes. And um, so unless we really have to do it, I'm going to keep on going. All right? All right? Because okay. now I'm going to get to Lyme disease, and I know all of you have been really waiting for this. And you're going to get more of this with Dr. Horowitz as well. But, so remember, the segue was that Lyme disease is one of the infections that we have to think about when we see this whole PANS syndrome or infectious triggered autoimmune encephalopathy, right? <coughs> so I want to go back to syphilis, way back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is Sir William Osler. Now I was trained in the uh, in University of Rochester by the pioneer of, psych of psychosocial bio biomedical medicine, George Engel. George Engel was an amazing man. He was the only person I ever met that every time he told us he had the medical students together, take us on the clinic or give us a lecture, whatever, and he said, I'll, I'll get your reference on that. And he, every reference he gave us, he wrote. It was amazing. It didn't matter what it was. It was asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, Parkinson. It was amazing. The guy was brilliant. And he also was brilliant because he was the pioneer of the, the psychosocial biomedical relationship. He wasn't confined to just medicine. He, he looked at the whole picture. And he made a deep impression on me as well as many of my other uh, medical school uh, students, right? And we learned about William Osler, because William Osler was the quintessential clinician. They didn't have a lot of labs in that day. And he said, there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation. And I agree with it, because that really is true. And I've learned in Rochester, we had a whole class on taking a history and doing a physical. And none of my other friends had a whole class on that for like three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Because we were told not to ask very quick questions. 
we were taught to ask open-ended questions to let the patient speak. Because they said in the history is where you get it all. Maybe 10% in the physical, certainly if it's, it's cancer, it's physical. But I'm talking about in, this, in a lot of these chronic complex cases. And I really agree that I sit with a patient for an hour and a half. And a lot of that, the physical doesn't take that long, it's the history. Getting the details helps clue me in as to what's happening with that patient. And William Osler was, was the best. And it's because in integrative medicine, that used to be called holistic medicine, is you want to see the whole picture. This is the elephant. If this guy's looking at it, he's saying, oh, it's a spear. This guy's saying, no, it's a snake. Oh, this is a tree trunk, it's a tree. The tail, it's a rope. No, it's an elephant. But if you only look at one piece, you lose the forest or the trees, you lose the whole picture. And how many of you really, you don't have to raise your hands, because but, but how many of you have been through that? Well, you've been seeing five, six, eight specialists, and everybody diagnoses one little piece, but doesn't put it together. I can't tell you how many people I see, and, and some people here know I have a tissue box on my desk, because people will come in, and I'll listen to their story, and they'll start crying. Not because, hopefully not because I've hurt their feelings. <laughs> I, I hope not. But because they're getting listened to for the first time. And it's unfortunately a medicine. You know that the guy, the doc's got his hand on the door as soon as he can or she can. And it's just a sad state of events, especially in these difficult situations. So that was then, right? The physician must keep a high index of suspicion regarding the possible diagnosis of syphilis because syphilis was called the great masquerader, the great imitator. Well, that's what it was called, all right? Especially in its advanced stages. And you see the spirochete of Lyme and syphilis? They're very similar. They're these spirochetes, spiral-shaped bacteria, right? Lyme disease has been called the next great masquerader, the next great imitator. First, syphilis being the first, and then the Lyme disease. And now, the physician must keep a high index of suspicion regarding the possible diagnosis of Lyme disease. It's very important to have that in your differential diagnosis. And I can't tell you how many people I see that have seen very smart docs at the best medical schools. And they come and they say, doc, doc, I've seen the best. I've seen the best, and I'm not going to name any medical schools at all. I've seen the best. So how do you feel? I feel like crap. But I saw the best. Because they were limited to their one sphere. They didn't see the whole picture, or they didn't think out of the box. And I know that, that and I, I don't fault them. They're hopefully doing, they're, they're most likely doing their best. It's just that this field of chronic complex disorders with multiple symptoms and multiple organs affected and multiple signs uh, need to have somebody with a high index of suspicion of the possibility of Lyme disease or co-infection. We know the figures how it's, uh, it was in 2015, CDC said, wow, it's not 30,000. 300,000 a year. I've never heard an increase in 10, that, 10 times. It's just because obviously it wasn't being accounted for. This is obviously, like I talked with the kids in autism, this is another very real epidemic. And this is easy. This is the bullseye, erythema migraines, right? Let me get a blood test to confirm it's lying, right? No, right? This is very early. The blood test is going to be negative. So if a doctor does a blood test and say, oh, that must be a spider bite. You don't have Lyme. You don't need a blood test. Osler would roll over in his grave. <laughs> you see this, and you can very safely say, hmm, I think you might have Lyme disease. No, you have Lyme disease, okay? This is what we call in medicine pathognomonic, okay? That's, quote, easy. You can cure Lyme in an early stage, generally, if you treat it long enough. We don't usually talk about cure in autism. We don't a lot of times talk about cure in Lyme. It's very difficult. We certainly can control it, get it to a point where the immune system can control it, but once it's in late stages, it's very hard to, quote, cure. Uh, and you need to have your immune system be your friend. That's why I spend so much time. But early stage, you may not beget the rash. Uh, a diagnostic, another diagnostic clue is a flu-like illness in the summer. If you get a summer flu, you have to think tick-borne disease. And another clue is that it gets better with an antibiotic. Uh-huh, that's another clue, especially one that's appropriate for Lyme disease, right? It affects numbers of systems, especially the skin, as you saw, joints, the nervous system, the heart, and with lots of symptoms. So it's generalized fatigue, joint pain, stiff neck, headaches, flu-like symptoms. You can get heart 
palpitations, heart block, swelling joints, not just pain in the joints, and inflammation, arthritis, encephalomyelitis, big medical term for inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord. Inflammation of the nervous system and line. Got to get back to inflammation to tie it all together, but it's very, very real here. Here you see an ear rash, but also you can see multiple rashes, more than one as the disease progresses. Here you see a swollen joint, especially a swollen knee. You see that in an endemic area like here, and you've got to think about Lyme disease. Here you see, I, just, I love this, an antique kind of uh, Bell's palsy. I like to say this is my, uh, it's not my grandma. Um, uh, but it's a one-sided, it's a facial droop. It's called Bell's palsy. It can be caused by other things other than Lyme. But if you have a suspicion, you have to suspect Lyme in these situations. Late stage Lyme is chronic and more difficult, persistent. You can have abnormalities in the musculoskeletal system, in the neurologic system, both central and peripheral, with signs and presentations that include, this is another big word, subacute encephalopathy. What does that mean? It means this subtle type of brain fog, cognitive dysfunction. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Also, chronic pro progressive what? Inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord. Late axonal neuropathies. These are neuropathies. And, well, the symptoms consistent with fibromyalgia. It could look like so many things. The next great masquerader. And here are ma chronic manifestations. I told you about some of these fatigue, headaches, cognitive dysfunction, cardiac symptoms, palpitations, eye symptoms, joint aches, muscle aches, fibromyalgia, joint swelling, arthritis, okay, nervous system things, central and peripheral, immune manifestations, and autoimmune disease. All these things can be seen in chronic stages of Lyme disease. It can have very many different presentations. And again, just to get a little further for the neurologic Lyme disease, when we talk about uh, confusion, short-term memory problems, word-finding difficulties, when you can't find the word, and I had a woman in yesterday who said, and my kids finish my sentences. That makes you think about the subtle encephalopathy, brain problem with Lyme disease. Okay, and then personality changes, school phobia, depression, anxiety, etc. In kids, sometimes we only see neuropsychiatric symptoms. We don't see joint pains. We might not see headaches or fevers, anything like that. We see irritability, personality change, depression, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction. The kids are no longer doing as well in school. They all of a sudden, they develop mood disro uh, disorders. Their mood dysregulates. They can go from zero to 60 like that. And I'm, I can see some people shaking their heads because they probably have kids that they may have seen this in. School phobia, anxiety, and sleep disorder, disorders like uh, um, insomnia may be the only manifestations, and they, they, you may be told your kid has anxiety or depression, when in reality, it's something underlying them. Why did they just develop this? We have to think about why. Is it Lyme? Is it Bartonella? Is it another co-infection? Is it strep-related or mycoplasma-related or virally-related? We just have to think about these things. And Lyme can, can masquerade as multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, various kinds of autoimmune disorders, Neuropsych disorders, you saw a bunch of the slides I put up with pans and pandas, certainly Lyme can do that. ADHD and autism, uh, it can masquerade as that. I would let you know, I had, uh, I was asked years ago, they started a Lyme and autism group and they wanted to be like a spokesperson. And I have to tell you that I really feel that Lyme can be involved in some cases of autism and autistic kids can get Lyme disease, but do I think that most of autism is Lyme disease? No not a chance, and they were quoting very, very high figures. But you have to think about it, because it may be transmitted from a mother who wasn't diagnosed and treated, so it gets uh, transmitted gestationally while they're pregnant. Neuro neuropathies and pain syndromes. Many of the people we see have chronic pain. Then when you treat their Lyme or Bartonella or other co-infections effectively, lo and behold, the pain gets better. So, chronic Lyme disease, the testing is unfortunately unreliable. You heard about that from Bob earlier today. 
Lyme spirochetes can evade the immune system. Uh, the test results are variable, as you heard. Um, there are false negatives. You can get not only the spirochetes, you can get cystic forms, cell wall deficient forms, uh, Lyme uh, bacteria hiding intracellularly, so it evades the immune system. You can get biofilms which protect it, and you have to break down to effectively treat it. And you can get either an upregulation or a suppression of the immune system, which makes this all so damn complex, really. It is very complex. The rash is frequently not uh, present. This is why some of these are difficult diagnoses. Tick bite, not more than 50% usually. We've talked about the testing. Uh, CSF, a lot of times if there's neural Lyme, they'll say, oh, the spinal fluid is negative. It's only uh, positive at best 30%, usually less than that. Um, and early antibiotics will abrogate the antibody response. So like Bob said, if you get that, I don't, I'm not a proponent of those two pills when you get it, because once you take those, it's, I don't think it's enough to stop Lyme, and if you get Lyme, you may never get the antibodies, and so you may get misdiagnosed. So we treat a tick bite with three weeks of doxycycline or septin. That's how we treat a tick bite. Uh, the bacteria hides from the immune system, and of course, you can have a, a suppressed immune system. You may not see the antibodies. Okay, the no Lyme diagnosis. I have, I know doctors, unfortunately, that will see a complex patient of mine and say, I don't know what you have, but I know you don't have Lyme disease. I don't know how they make that diagnosis, but I would say that frightens me. Because if you don't know what they have, that's fine. Leave it at that. I don't know what you have. But when you tell somebody you don't have Lyme disease, you steer them in a whole other direction that may put, take them years to find out, if ever, to find out what they have. And again, I just feel, I feel badly about this. I don't, these doctors, I'm, you know, I'm sure they believe what they're saying, but I'm not sure how you could say that in the state of the art where we are. And so the big conundrum in chronic Lyme, or what is called post-treatment Lyme syndrome, PTLS, is, is it chronic infection, or is it infection and autoimmunity, or autoimmunity? And I think probably it's a combination. But we have to recognize that sometimes you can kill a bacteria, you get fragments of that dead bacteria that can still stimulate the immune system in terms of autoimmunity, okay? And this is just an article talking about autoimmunity in approximately 50% of patients with persistent Lyme, Lyme symptoms. So again, we have evidence of the antineuronal antibodies. So we have to think very akin to what I was talking about with the whole infectious triggered autoimmune brain inflammation. And this is Katz who talked about it as well with Lyme, treating an autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme with IM bicillin and or IVIG in this subgroup. So this, his observations and Chandra's results support the existence of autoimmunity in this complex chronic condition and the use of immune modulation when indicated. And here's some of the laboratory features which support this Lyme-related autoimmunity. Certain HLA, DR4, DRB1, O401, this is a certain genetic subtype. Persistent IgM, those are early antibodies, against the 31KD or the OSP-A antibody and these, again, antineural antibodies. These are just evidence of autoimmunity related to Lyme disease. So let's just do a couple minutes on co-infections, then I'll wrap up the treatment. So I think I'll be okay. I think I have plenty of things. So good. Good. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the four questions, I'll let everybody stretch. But I've got to just, all right. Um, so it's not only Lyme, and many of you know this, I'm probably speaking to the choir here, but the point is, for those of you who don't or new to this area, maybe you're coming to check out what's going on, um, that in the tick itself there are other infectious organisms. And we have to be aware of these co-infections. The ones on this slide are the classic ones that we think, I call them the basic co-infections, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, and then, of course, there's others. There's the rickettsia, brucella, tularensis, uh, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and viruses. Does that make you dizzy? Yeah. yeah. Well, if that makes you dizzy, wait, wait till Dr. Harwitz comes out. He's going to make you more dizzy. So. <laughs> I see a smile in the back. <laughs> so I just took out a couple of them to make chronic babesia-like patterns. 
Uh, this is Babesia. This is like a, a parasitic type organism that gets transmitted by the, the Lyme tick. It can cause neurobehavioral, neuropsychiatric symptoms. Memory problems can be prominent. A, a head pressure sensation, so headaches but a certain type. Sleep disturbances with weird dreams and nightmares. I yellow the ones that I'd like you to think of that may clue you into it being with these. Yeah. Fevers, also sometimes you can't get warm. Sweats, especially at night, and you're not menopausal, that would clue you into the BZ. It's like a malaria type parasite. Appetite swings, dizziness, vertigo, rapid heartbeat. Another thing that makes you think of it is chest pains and this shortness of breath, which patients will describe as an air hunger. They can't get enough breath in. They're not smokers. They don't have COPD. This makes us think of, of Babesia and tinnitus and intermittent blurred vision. A lot of these are, are overlap with the other tick-borne things, Lyme and Bartonella, but some of these are specific. We think about Babesia when we hear some of these things, especially with the air hunger and the sweats and if they have recurrent fevers. Bartonella, chronic Bartonella-like pattern, pain. Pain can be very, very big in Bartonella can be wandering types. Joint pain, they can be swollen joints. The headache can be severe, and sometimes it's described as an ice pick in around the eyes. Migraines, either new migraines or much worsening of previous migraines. Cognitive and memory symptoms, maybe milder than that seen with Babesia, but certainly can be ex existing. Swollen lymph glands, because Bar Bartonella can cause swollen lymph glands. So you may see not only over here where you get a sore throat, but it can be in the groin, in the axilla. So we, we think about Bartonella in those things. In fact, Bartonella was described earlier on as catch scratch fever. What you get? You got a line of a, a, of a kind of a, a infected uh, lymph root, and then you got a swollen, tender lymph gland. That, you know, that's cat scratch after a cat scratch. Uh, mild sore throat. Would, um, and GI symptoms can be very prominent in Bartonella. Gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, dysmotility, either rapid, more loose stools or constipation, some problems with swallowing, mild increase in liver enzymes, which we can see on a lab test, reflux, and gallbladder dysfunction. All these can be seen. These will make you think maybe, make sure we don't forget uh, Bartonella, we have a lot of GI complaints. Skin rashes, especially these red, purplish streaks, which I'll show you in a second, and this crawling, burning, weird sensations on the skin, as well as painful feet, painful soles. That will clue you in, to, or, heel, or heels, can clue you into Bartonella. And here are these violations, striae, I want you to show these. See these red marks? These are not just scratch marks. These are there. This was a very affected 14 years now. I think he's now probably 17 or 18. Severe rage episodes when he would pull clumps of his mother's hair out. I mean, this is a child in the autism spectrum who, uh, who also developed Bartonella. So you see these? These are big, big clues. But if you don't do a physical exam, you don't see them. And the next patient, this was a, a, like a 15-year-old uh, uh, obese teenager who came in in her hoodie and her sweats. And of course, she was withdrawn from her parents. She was very severe neuropsychiatric illness. And thankfully, I got her to let me do an exam and look behind her knees. You don't see stretch. Now, this is not someone who just gained the weight, so it's not like you're looking. A lot of times, they always just stretch marks. These are purplish striae, all right? You don't usually see these behind the knee. And the only reason I was lucky that she let me look at them. And also, look, this is the belly. You think these are just stretch marks, these really Violations, we call them purplish, reddish, free eye. No, those are classic Bartonella. And when you treat them, they get less and less. And I have follow-ups with her. Number one, she's going back to school. She hasn't been in school for three years, which is just phenomenal, truthfully. And number two, these are these are disappearing. And she's a changed person. Her father is just her father has really stayed with it, and he's, when he comes in, it's just a bit, you know, for me that's the goodies of doing it's very hard, it's very difficult. But the goodies are when you see these kids come around. That other kid I showed you who now is able to go water skiing and travel. And you know, in the car they had to be scared. He used to just mother would be driving and just jump over the seat and rip her hair out. So, you know, the fact that he doesn't do that anymore and he's not fully recovered, but no, it's scary, right? I I see people laughing. This is what happens with some of these kids. You're dealing with severe neuropsychiatric symptoms. And Bartonella is one of the worst for that. Really. Bartonella is really bad. 
So, in a lot of ways, I think of myself as a medical detective when I deal with these what we call multi-system, multi-symptom disorders. And as I said, in the first book I wrote, this was in 1997, The Road to Immunity. So it goes back, what, 20 years, oof. Um, if you don't look, you won't see. And if you don't listen, you won't hear. And I try to teach the doctors this, and unfortunately, it's the system we have with insurance-based medicine. You get seven minutes with the patient. You want to hear something in the first 30 seconds, and then you, you try to make your diagnosis, and you write your prescription, you walk out the door. And it's, for these chronic kind of illnesses, they can't be dealt with like that. And it's a sad state of affairs. So the key is, you should make sure when you're seeing your doctor, you say, please, please look at what's causing my illnesses, and two, please listen to what I'm saying. Just listen, okay? I'm not making these things up. And if you have a doctor that won't listen to you, uh, you may think about trying to find one that will, especially if you have these multi-system, multi-symptom disorders. The key is patient-centered diagnosis and treatment, not just putting on a label. Unfortunately, medicine, there was a, a, a doctor dentist years ago uh, who said this, the name of the game is the name. In medicine, we want to figure something out quickly and put a label on it, because if we put the label on it, that tells us what drug to use. The problem with what I'm talking about, it's complex, and there's a lot of interrelationships. And so the key is not treating a diagnosis, it's treating the patient. I have sad to say, when I was in medical school, okay, they tell the interns, you go take care of the hip in there, you go take care of the liver in there. Mm -hmm. It's a sad state of affairs, but that's the truth. Rather than you take care of Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, as a whole person, you were going in there to take care of this. And that's, of course, they're stressed. Interns and residents are stressed. But the bottom line is there's too much of that in this. So the key is patient-centered diagnosis and treatment. So how do we ultimately treat? We look and we listen. We think clinically. We get laboratory guided by history. Okay, it's important to get a very thorough history and then support it with lab, the appropriate lab work and do a comprehensive integrative medicine evaluation and treatment program. And that consists of, this is the integrative functional medicine approach to neuroimmune disorders. We deal with the potential factors that may underlie and contribute to these issues, whether they be recurrent infections, chronic infections, chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. We've got to think about toxicants, heavy metals, chemicals, infections, gut issues, dysbiosis, abnormal intestinal microbiota, the bacteria, yeast, intestinal hyperpermeability, what we call a leaky gut, dietary peptides like gluten and casein. They can be very inflammatory. Sometimes we have to go on a diet that avoids gluten or avoids dairy. If you avoid dairy, you have to make sure you take calcium and magnesium. Food allergies and sensitivities, they can vary. Healthy things, supposed with corn, which is unfortunately not that healthy a lot of times because it's GMO. But corn can cause allergies, soy can cause allergies, wheat, milk, eggs, what have you. Environmental allergies and sensitivities, especially mold. Mold could be a real culprit in neuropsychiatric problems. Nutritional deficiencies and imbalances. Zinc, magnesium, vitamin D is so crucial. Hormonal imbalances, including thyroid and adrenals, very, very important. And I'm talking about imbalances, not only frank deficiencies, sometimes it's insufficiency. You're low normal and you're told you're normal, but for your system, your body, your clinical condition, you may need some help, even though you're, quote, low normal and not, and not obviously low on the blood test. And then I've been talking to you about immunological imbalances the whole time. Okay, so let's go to treatment now. I have uh, I'll, I'll maybe 10 or 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five. I mean, I'd probably do this in five or 10 minutes, so I do 20 minutes, okay. Uh, treatment of Lyme disease, appropriate antibiotics. You're gonna hear a lot more of this from Dr. Horowitz, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. The key I want you to get from me, and you'll get it more from him, is uh, long enough course. These short courses of antibiotics don't do it. I've seen so many people treated with two weeks of an antibiotic in Lyme. That is not gonna, it might help initially a little bit, but the chance of a recurrence is very, very great. You need to treat long enough 
You need to use combinations that provide additive mechanisms. Why? Because you have to address the different forms. The, the, not only the cell wall forms, but the cystic forms or round body forms, or the intracellular forms that are hiding in the cell. You need intracellular antibiotics. You need to consider those co-infections I talk about, not only Lyme, you need to consider biofilms. And we have ways, we have these enzymes that can help digest the biofilm and allow the antibiotic to penetrate and get to it. And you want to prevent toxicity of the antibiotics. So we give gut, really good gut probiotics. And I'm going to give you a caveat here. Out of all the supplements that you might use, in my mind, the two most important to get at the highest, highest quality are probiotics. So if you go in and get a cheapy probiotic, you're probably getting what you paid for, okay? And fish oils. You want fish oils free of mercury, fish, free of PCBs, and there are some certifications, certainly the ones that I'm sure I use, and I'm sure Dr. Highwich uses as well, they are at the highest grade, because you don't want to go get a cheap fish oil that's going to be rancid, it's not going to give you the anti-inflammation you want, it may be contaminated with um, heavy metals or PCBs. So I'll leave you with that. I mean, certainly there are other ones as well, the curcumins and various things I'm going to mention, but I, those two especially. And you want to prevent liver toxicity. We give herbs to, and nutrients to protect the liver when we use antibiotics. Okay, the other integrative medicine treatments, natural anti-inflammatory agents, I'll show you them in a second. Curcumin, very, very important. And also getting the absorbable forms. There are newer curcumins out that we use now that are in curcuminoid oils. They're the highest absorbable and the most potent. There's dietary modifications such as gluten-free, casein-free, or if you figure out food allergies, avoiding them, stay away from sugar. Sugar will adversely affect your ability to fight these infections and will also adversely affect your immune system in terms of autoimmunity and nutritional supplements that hopefully you see someone who knows what they're doing so they can give you the ones that you need. We call it targeted nutrition targeting nutritional supplements that we try to figure out. We can treat symptoms, fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, but ultimately we want to treat underlying, but you can treat the symptoms as well concomitantly. And as I said, preventive treatments, probiotics, cobiotics, liver protection, and we treat herxes. For those of you who've heard of herxes and diots, when you take an antibiotic or you take even a, a, a microbial anti, like an herbal antimicrobial, you can get a flare of symptoms. So you can use charcoal, glutathione. We have certain homeopathics that we use that can really help these Herxheimers. Um, herbal treatments can be very helpful either during antibiotic treatment or after antibiotic treatment. Some people only use those. I really believe you have to knock it out, but the herbs can be very, very helpful. Natural hormones, especially thyroid, in some ways of adrenal, and we can actually test the adrenals, and then we, if they're too high, we try to down down-regulate them. If they're too low, we try to up-regulate them to try to get them into the normal range. Immune modulation, things like nutrients as well as IVIG, which is in immune globulins. We use high-dose ones for the autoimmunity. I do a lot of that with the kids that have this brain inflammation. I've had a lot of success with that, but it's an extremely powerful treatment. And sometimes I have a young doctor who goes, oh, can I, can I do that? This is not something that you just want to round out and do. It's extremely expensive and it's in very, very, uh, it's got a lot of side effects. Uh, uh, IV vitamin C can be very helpful, especially higher doses, which can really help the immune system. And neurofeedback for those who get anxiety or ADHD to help balance the, uh, the brain range. Okay. And lastly, let me end with the PANS PANDAS treatments because, uh, yeah, I have five more minutes. Okay, I'll do five minutes. So if, if, if antibiotics, uh, if this group A beta strep is what incites the PANDAS, then you can treat it with antibiotics for strep. And then you can also use prophylactic antibiotics. Remember, in rheumatic fever, we treat kids to 18 years or 21 years. I don't like that. I don't like to use long-term antibiotics. But sometimes you have no choice. You have to keep the inciting agent at bay. The, that's the front end. The back end is to use immunomodulatory treatment, like IVIG or plasmapheresis, where you actually take the blood out, you take out the antibodies, and then you put it back in. That's done in medical centers. It's extremely expensive. It's also got side effects. These are big time treatments. We only reserve these for the sickest, sickest kids. But there are other antimicrobials in addition to antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, if those are involved, and tonsillectomy. And the kids that have this chronic strep, 
the antibiotics sometimes can get way down at the, in the crypts, so we have their tonsils taken out. I never was a big proponent of tonsillectomy, but now I do it sometimes, and lo and behold, these kids can get better because it's like an abscess. The antibiotic can't get in there, and the ear, nose, and throat doctors that are open enough to do it will say, God, that was the cruddiest looking set of tonsils I ever saw. And yet when you look in the throat, you don't see it because it's way down deep. And then enhancing those T regs. Remember I talked you about those, those T regs that keep everything in balance? Vitamin D, probiotics and prebiotics, Tai Chi, and regular exercise all can enhance T reg function. It's things that you can do very simply, relatively inexpensively. And this is just the uh, uh, thing of the potent uh, immunoregulative function of vitamin D. Look what it does. It can induce Tregs, right? Those cells that are so important in immune balance. It can inhibit these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Remember the ones I showed you? IL-1 beta, tumor necrosis factor alpha. I showed you in those schematics. It can increase IL-10 production, okay? Vitamin D can increase the anti-inflammatory IL-10, and it can inhibit these antigen-specific T-cell activation. In essence, it can modulate the immune system in the way that we want it. And there it is again. I love this schematic. That's why I use it. Okay. Curcumin, one of the most potent natural antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. It works various four different inflammatory pathways. It is risen up there in terms of some of, one of the supplements that I think most people take. I take it on an everyday basis to try to prevent uh, a neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's and things. Um, unfortunately, my sister uh, contracted Alzheimer's and um, although I think it was environmental, I still think anything you can do to be protective when you take into account your family history is important. And what does curcumin do? Curcumin increases IL-10, anti-inflammatory, and it blocks the differentiation to Th17, induces the Tregs, blocks the Th17, Therefore, it is anti-inflammatory, okay? And now we go from this to this. Now, I'd like you to know, this slide, I actually made myself. <laughs> this may be the most proud I am of this entire lecture. <laughs> because I needed it for a lecture and I, I couldn't get my assistant to do it. So I had to play with it and I said, oh my God. So I'm probably going to show it to you again. I'm going to go back. And uh, now you see imbalance and, oh my god, I made this one. <laughs> and then lastly, IVIG for OCD and ticks. Plasma exchange and IVIG. This was, goes back to 1999. We're both effective in lessening of symptom severity for children with infectious triggered OCD and tick disorders. Further, of course, how every article ends, especially early on. Further studies need to, uh, needed to determine the active mechanism of these interventions and, and determine which children with OCD and tick disorders will benefit from immunomodulatory therapies. So in uh, future perspectives is just that, uh, that the potential role of immune modulation as a therapeutic option for psychiatric disorders is very exciting and opens up potential treatments. So in conclusion, PANS, PANDAS is real. Treatment with antidepressants, SSRIs, and cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, can be helpful, but as sole treatments are inadequate because you're not getting down to the underlying root causes. There is evidence, albeit not large, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies to support use of antibiotics and immunomodulatory treatments, although there have been more and more studies with antibiotics, and some are going on now with IVIG. So, but IVIG especially, uh, in, in, in my experience, can be quite helpful in these children, in selected kids who are really, really sick. I wouldn't just do this in a, in a kid who was mildly sick. And lastly, a comprehensive integrative medicine approach, which includes antibiotics and IVIG, but also addresses GI issues, liver protection, other infections like mycoplasma, Lyme disease, viruses, funguses, and immune modulation can add significantly to chances for improvement, especially in these chronic complex cases. So this is the book that I wrote uh, 10 years ago. I'm actually uh, presently uh, working on something uh, right now, but not to be discussed. 
and um, um, this was this was for the four A's. But really, if you look, at, if you're interested in inflammation, it does talk. It was obviously ten years ago. It's still quite relevant. Talks a lot about the nutrients, but um, I think it just it, 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 it's broaching the whole aspect of inflammation than ten years ago. And I think we've come a long way in figuring out what contributes to these three different disorders in terms of inflammation and immune dysregulation in PANS, PANDAS, Lyme disease, and autism spectrum disorders. So anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.